Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participant lines are in a listen-only mode and will be throughout today's conference call. Questions will not be taking over the phone during today's conference call. However, you may submit questions on the Q&A box on the lower right hand of your screen. Simply type in your question in the question box and either send it or send it privately. Any questions submitted will only be seen by the leaders. Today's conference call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And now I will turn the call over to your host for today, Dr. Richard McKeon. Sir, you may begin. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the JED Foundation, we want to welcome you to the call today. Um, the, uh, I think the speakers that you will be hearing today will be discussing a, an extremely important issue of uh, the taking of uh, leave um, by students uh, with mental health issues on college campuses, really a, a critical decision with long-lasting um, influence and implications for the students as well as for the, as well as for the colleges. Um, so we think that you will learn a lot from today's presentations. We will do your best using the chat function to respond to your questions. And we are grateful to be able to participate and partner with you all um, in, the, in these efforts uh, to assure that, that students experiencing emotional distress or mental health problems on college campuses um, have the best possible response to their needs. Uh, so, with that, I will turn it over uh, uh, to my colleague, Dr. Victor Schwartz of the JED Foundation, um, with whom SAMHSA has worked uh, closely over the years on many issues related to college mental health and suicide prevention. And they have been an incredible resource and ally um, in moving forward these important issues. So, Victor, on to you. Hi. Hi, Richard. Thanks very much for the introduction and, and for the overview. Uh, it is an honor to uh, partner with SAMHSA on a number of, of these projects, and uh, it feels like, Richard, you and I have this habit of meeting at webinars, so it's, uh, it's kind of nice. Uh, so as, as Richard mentioned, we are going today to be discussing uh, the parameters around mental health leaves for college students. And uh, a lot of the information you'll be hearing about is going to be based on uh, an experience uh, of Georgetown University uh, in working with the Office for Civil Rights of the Department of Education, uh, where they had a, uh, an ongoing back and forth that resulted in a kind of model uh, program for uh, working with students who need leaves for mental health issues. So just to quickly talk through the structure and give some brief introduction, uh, we're going to start out with uh, a, a brief presentation from uh, the group at Georgetown who actually did this work with the Office for Civil Rights. We'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Phil Mileman, who uh, has been the Director of Counseling uh, and Psychi Psychiatric Services at Georgetown for now more than 10 years after uh, serving in that role at Cornell for many years. He's also a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Georgetown, uh, has been the editor of the Journal for College Student Psychotherapy for many years. Uh, and is now uh, an emeritus in that role. Uh, we'll also be hearing from his uh, colleague, Tom Cerolenzio, who is a, a senior associate dean uh, at Georgetown College. Uh, Tom oversees the first and second year student dean's office and has worked in uh, student affairs as in the dean's office for now more than 20 years. They'll be describing for us uh, the experience 
uh, of Georgetown and working with OCR. Uh, we'll then be hearing from uh, Karen Bauer, who uh, is a name that may be familiar also to many of you who are listening in. Karen has been one of the leading voices uh, and advocates for students as an attorney, uh, first at the Bazelon Center for uh, Mental Health Law, where she uh, actually litigated a number of the more well-known cases involving college students and uh, are with mental health issues. Uh, and so she'll be really sort of explaining what some of the concerns in this process are from the student perspective. Uh, and then I'll be uh, making a couple of comments to uh, hopefully round things out from my own uh, peculiar and eccentric perspective of having worked in counseling services as a dean of students and uh, now just a uh, sort of generic kibitzer and um, someone, as, as Richard said, who's been involved in uh, the Jed Foundation and, and you know, working on a national uh, level with a bunch of college mental health and, and uh, college administration and higher ed uh, focused groups for quite a long time. Uh, we'll then be having a conversation among ourselves for about 15 or 20 minutes discussing some of the questions that might emerge and we'll hopefully leave about 20 minutes for Q&A from the audience. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Phil and Tom to uh, give us a, an overview of their experience and what they learned in their work with the Office for Civil Rights. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. This is Phil Mileman, and I'm sitting here with my colleague. Cool. I will let introduce himself. Sure. I'd just like to say um, hello to everyone. My name is uh, Tom Chiralanzio, and um, I'm going to share some perspectives uh, in my work with students who have sought medical leaves of absences and um, our coordination and collaborative work with our counseling center here, which is run by Phil Mileman. Um, so uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. Um, I've been involved with medical leave since about 1986 um, when I was on the staff of the counseling service at Dartmouth College. Uh, they needed someone to oversee that process. And as I moved through my career at different institutions, um, I have worked on this and refined it uh, with each succeeding year. Um, uh, at uh, the College of William and Mary, at Cornell University, and now here at, at Georgetown. Um, so what I'd like to do is give you a little background on uh, medical leaves of absence uh, in general um, so that we can put this all in context. Um, the goal of a medical leave is to support a student in succeeding in school, save their academic record, enable the student to get some help and uh, come back to the university with a, an enhanced uh, ability to function both academically and personally. Um, however, a medical leave is really the last resort. Um, there are academic interventions that can be made uh, prior to considering a medical leave. So for example, um, if the student consults the counseling center and the student is really in quite a bit of distress and is behind on assignments, we can, with the student's permission, recommend some alternatives. So, for example, um, we can recommend extensions on assignments, on homework, on papers. We can recommend delayed examinations. Um, these, are, these would be typically handled by our calling the dean's office uh, and discussing the case with them. By the way, we don't, um, as a matter of policy, we don't interact directly with uh, professors because um, what happens is the professor may think they're the only one dealing with this issue when in fact the student may be having trouble across all classes and the dean is the individual who can survey all the professors and find out what is actually going on. So we always interact with the dean's office and then let the dean handle it with the professors. Um, taking, taking it further, so let's say um, delayed exams, extensions on papers don't work. Another option is the student could take incompletes at the end of the term and finish up the, the coursework uh, within a specified period of time after the semester or term ends. 
Another option is to drop a course, uh, again, for medical reasons. Sometimes that uh, if it's a particularly uh, troubling course and it's throwing the student into disarray, sometimes removing a single course will enable them to refocus and uh, uh, be able to function well in the remaining courses. In less frequently two course drops, if someone needs more than two course drops, then we're probably looking at the need for a medical leave of absence. So the medical leave is not the first go-to place. The medical leave is actually a last resort when all else fails. Um, and the, the other thing that I'd like to add and emphasize um, is, as Phil mentioned, Dr. Meilman mentioned, um, really we are looking out for the best interest of the student at this time, and thus these accommodations exist to try to work with the student to help that individual student get through this time of, of medical concern um, and really emphasizing the collaborative work. I think that's a really key word um, is that this is a collaborative team trying to work and support the student between the counseling center, the dean's office, the student, and the student's professors um, all working together to try to figure out what could be the best possible solution before going to the resort of taking um, a full medical leave. A um, couple of other points I want to make is um, th we're talking about voluntary medical leaves. Uh, involuntary leaves is a topic uh, that's entirely separate. Um, we have a policy on involuntary leaves, but it's not for medical reasons um, because that would probably be a violation of uh, uh, disability law. but um, uh, we've only used that actually once in the last 15 years. So involuntary leaves almost never happen here. Um, this, so I want to emphasize that this is about voluntary medical leaves. I also want to mention that this is uh, different than the um, uh, reasonable accommodations for ongoing documented disabilities. Uh, when we get to a medical leave situation, it's more about something that's occurred uh, in the um, in the near term, not something that's been longstanding and documented. Um, so by way of background, in 2011, we revised our, our voluntary medical leave policy uh, in response to a, a um, complaint to the Office for Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, there was a complaint that the then existing medical leave policy imposed an unfair burden on a student's uh, return. Um, so we arrived at, um, you know, there were two, two ways to go. One is um, the Department of Education can do an investigation and issue a finding. Um, the alternative is to arrive at a negotiated resolution. And uh, we, we chose the latter. We had uh, several meetings with the uh, Washington, D.C. Office of um, the uh, Office for Civil Rights. Um, every district, ha the various districts have their own subset of staff, but this was the staff that was here in town. And sitting around the table were the OCR representatives, our legal counsel, uh, our office here, uh, the CAPS, the Counseling and Psychiatric Service, um, the Assistant Vice President for Student Health, the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Affirmative Action. A um, couple of other things uh, that we wound up with um, in terms of goals here in this negotiated resolution was to help the student, um, we've alluded to this before, help the student avoid failing grades, avoid academic suspension if they're at risk for that, allow time for treatment, restore health, return with a much better chance to succeed, and to do this in a way that conformed to recent, recent interpretations of the uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, uh, while at the same time maintaining what we needed to maintain to have an effective policy. So when we talk about uh, medical leaves, there are uh, several different sections to it. The first one is the exit process. Um, so the first part of it is the leave taking. That has to be initiated by the student. Um, uh, it cannot be initiated by parents. Parents can suggest it. Parents can ask for it. 
Uh, it can be recommended by a dean. Um, it can be recommended by us in the counseling service, but um, unless the student is agreeable to it because it's voluntary, uh, nothing can happen uh, unless, un unless and until the student says, I want to go that route. We then would make a recommendation for a leave, assuming the situation is a legitimate mental health concern interfering with functioning. We do not make the determination for the leave. We make a recommendation for the leave. The dean's office is the office that's empowered to uh, assign a medical leave status. And same thing on the return side. Um, we make a recommendation. The dean's office will typically enact that recommendation. Sometimes they disagree with us, but most of the time we're in agreement. Um, You'll see that I um, uh, put a comment here on the uh, slide that says no drive-by medical leaves, or as someone once put it, a medical leave to go. You know, someone says, I'm getting on an airplane to go to Texas in three hours, can I stop by and get a medical leave? The answer is no, um, for a number of reasons. One is that um, the student is in a whirlwind. They typically will not remember anything that happened during that visit. Um, we need, if we don't know the student beforehand, we need at least an hour to do an assessment to find out what's going on, probably another hour to um, answer questions and take care of paperwork. So we have stopped um, by um, uh, doing these uh, so-called drive-by medical leaves. Um, we will typically recommend a treatment plan and the need to engage in some kind of productive activity. Um, if that's appropriate, uh, and the, the treatment, the time frame required documentation for processing a return are all based on an individualized assessment and are put into writing uh, for the student. Th this is really important. Um, OCR uh, is asking always for an individualized assessment. It has to be tailored to that student. So that's a critical piece. Um, also, in the exit letter, OCR has asked us to justify uh, why we're asking for certain things. So if we ask for evidence of productive daily activity, and, and we have to say why we're asking for that, uh, why we're making a recommendation for treatment. If we're asking for a personal statement on the other end, we have to say why we're asking for a personal statement. We didn't go into that level of detail earlier, um, and it makes the the letter a lot longer. Our letters are usually three or four pages long, but we're following the guidance provided us by OCR. The next um, bullet here is invariably, invariably the students, even though everything is in the letter about how to return, students without fail lose that letter. It just happens. Um, in the rush of leaving, they misplace it, they put it somewhere, they don't know where they left it. So um, we actually had a consultant come here uh, a year ago, Dr. John Bishop, the um, Counseling Center Emeritus at uh, University of Delaware, and he interviewed many students who had returned from medical leave and uh, interviewed deans, interviewed CAP staff, made some recommendations. And one of the recommendations he made, as well as uh, students on our mental health advisory board, was to make the letters um, permanently available to the students uh, electronically. So we give them a link that only they can look at that has their letter, and we found that extraordinarily useful. Um, so um, that might be a, a suggestion for people who are revisiting their medical leave policy. Um, in terms of grades, if the, lead, if the leave happens during the course of the term, uh, typically no grades, no letter grades are recorded for that a semester. Um, if, if the leave happens after the semester ends, and let's say the student has sat for finals, those grades count, but if they, if they then come in after finals and want a medical leave, we can do what we call a go-forward medical leave. In other words, it would start after that last completed semester um, ends. That's right. So um, the only thing I would add here, just, just for a little bit more clarity again, is that um, 
hopefully, you know, we have learned throughout the course of the semester if a student is struggling um, and trying to offer different solutions to them. But again, if we find that, um, you know, there are no other solutions working for that individual student and they do need to take the medical leave, um, as Dr. Milman mentioned, um, we will simply put on the student's transcript leave of absence. Um, they do not earn credit for the coursework and they do not earn grades. The grades, there are no grades that go into their GPA. It simply is just a leave for the rest of the term. Um, but I do also want to reiterate something that Dr. Milman said that if a student actually completes the semester um, and uh, sits for exams but doesn't pass the exam or doesn't turn in some final work um, and the professor grades the student, the grades will remain on the transcript. And as Dr. Milman said, um, you know, we will do a medical leave going forward, but we don't go back um, and change grades um, if a student is taking a leave after the, se the semester concludes. Um, so we just want to make sure that everyone has an understanding of the process and the policy that we have here at Georgetown with reference to medical leaves and then grades on transcripts and when the student takes the leave. Um, one other point is um, uh, the timing of this. Sometimes we get a request uh, that um, I, a student says, I was very distressed, I was very distraught um, a year and a half ago and I'd now like to wipe out those grades and have it considered a medical leave. As a matter of policy, we don't do uh, retroactive medical leaves and uh, I think that's a very wise policy. I think in the rare instance where a student was actually hospitalized a year and a half ago and there's contemporaneous records of that, that would be a different story. Um, but uh, so far we haven't run into that situation. Now let's talk about the return process. So students are submitting paperwork from their providers as to their readiness to return to the academic environment. Uh, we, uh, they may also be sending us a personal statement, a letter from a reliable adult community observer who can comment on their ability to function on a daily basis. Um, now per OCR's guidance, uh, we're required to give significant weight to the outside provider's recommendation. So typically we will defer to the outside provider, whatever they uh, say. There is a provision that we can challenge that if we think that the provider was not an appropriate provider, but that's, that has never occurred actually. Um, if all the paperwork is in order, all the documentation is there, the student, we get a good report from the provider, the reasonable personal statement, a community observer says, yeah, this person is doing well, um, we then have a check-in meeting. Now this was, this is new in the policy. We used to do an assessment. Um, OCR said you cannot do an assessment. You can have a check-in meeting to talk about things like um, future treatment, uh, resources, how are you going to maintain your health once you get back, but you cannot do an assessment. So we now have these check-in meetings. The only time that we can actually call a halt to that process um, at the check-in meeting is if it's obvious that the student um, uh, is unfit. You know, as I put here on the slide, suicidal or psychotic, hallucinating, delusional, something like that. But short of that, which I can't ever remember happening, um, we, uh, we don't halt the process at that point. So l assuming the student is uh, ready to return, from our perspective, we then contact the dean's office. The dean's office, if it has no objection or concerns, endorses the leave and uh, the student returns to the campus. Another piece here, this last bullet, talks about the Office of Student Outreach and Support, which is case management. That is not a, a CAPS function, that's a university function. And Dr. Bishop, in his consultation, suggested that um, we do more to support students upon their return. So we now have them at the check-in visit sign a, a permission form for us to let the case manager know uh, that the student is returning. Uh, that office then reaches out to the student and sets up a meeting with them to talk about all the resources that they might need. Um, 
Now, uh, some issues that are really important to be aware of here in medical leaves. Um, medical leaves uh, are not undertaken lightly. Uh, they're they only will occur when the issues are pretty serious. So we're talking about uh, uncontrolled bipolar disorder, suicidality, borderline personality issues with major disruptiveness uh, to the student, uh, him or herself, um, sometimes to other people, but that's not really the issue. It's really how they themselves are able to function in school. Uh, other major impairments in functioning. So these are not, um, uh, you know, run-of-the-mill depression cases, for example. Most students, you know, the the largest number of students coming, the, the largest number of diagnoses of, of students coming to college counseling centers uh, are in the category of anxiety disorders and depressive disorders. So we see hundreds of students who are depressed or anxious, but most of those will never need a medical leave. Um, the ones who do need it uh, are these folks who are really suffering and cannot function. And our stance is that if the problems are that severe and the person cannot function in school and requires a complete withdrawal from the university, then the remedy absolutely needs to include a significant treatment intervention. The other thing I want to say is that this is an at-risk group. This, this group of individuals, the subset of individuals who actually take medical leaves um, and as I note here on this third bullet, even when students do everything we've asked them to do, they've gotten treatment, they've, um, they've used their time effectively, they've done everything they could possibly do to um, earn the ability to come back to school, um, 30 to 40 percent will wind up having further difficulty upon return or maybe a semester or two later and will uh, take another medical leave. So my observation of this over the last 30-some um, years is that this group of students who takes medical leaves, there's something different about them than the typical student. So this is a more, um, more uh, at-risk group. The other thing that is a little bit, um, that's important to be aware of is that Upon taking the leave, students instantly look better in many cases, and actually in most cases, and the question is why. Well, it's because all the pressure is relieved. Um, and they go home and uh, they say, I feel good, um, but the problem is that a geographic cure rarely cures anything, and they really do need treatment. Um, uh, so we, we maintain that that's an important part of their getting better. Now, some other issues. Um, many students will resist the notion of taking a leave even when it's clear that they're going to fail all their courses. This is their prerogative. And I have seen any number of students who, in September, you can see it's going south as a clinician. You say, gee, you know, we need to keep an eye on this. It may not work out this term. Response is, no, no, I don't want a medical leave. Um, October, it's getting worse. We say the same thing. Gee, maybe you should consider this as an option. November, it's really falling apart. Nope, I want to stay. Finally, we get to the last week of classes because our deadline for medical leaves is the last day of classes. So we get to the last week of classes. The student's been, been advised by the dean that they're going to fail all of their courses um, and the only remedy uh, to save their academic record would be a medical leave. Uh, at that point, oftentimes we see the student capitulate and say, okay, I'll take a medical leave. The interesting thing, and Tom, you may want to speak about this, um, is that um, students sometimes have the perception that it was involuntary, that they were forced to take a medical leave by the dean. But that is never the case. It's that the circumstances that they've allowed to have happen almost leave them no choice. Right. Yeah, so what I would add to that is that if, for example, as, as Dr. Mileman was mentioning, you have a student that um, has progressed through the semester but declined academically, and it's become very clear that they're going to fail all their courses, um, 
And, you know, what we try to emphasize to the student is that we want them to try, if they can, to take control over the situation. And what I mean by that is that if the student declines and says, no, I'm going to try to sit for my exams and finish them out, and then again, the student does indeed fail all their courses, the university has to act on that student's academic status. And then there's a review to determine whether that student would be suspended from the institution or even dismissed from the institution. And when we're in meetings with students that are in this situation, we try to make certain that they understand that it is in their best interest to take control of the situation and maybe seek out that medical leave rather than the institution after the fact then enforcing a suspension or a dismissal. Thanks for uh, clarifying that. It's so helpful to have a dean's perspective uh, on that. Um, another issue to be aware of um, is that it's I've rarely met a hometown provider or an outside provider who says a student isn't ready to return. Um, there's a little bit of a complication on this because uh, they don't get to see the student in the academic arena uh, with all the social stressors and the academic stresses. And so it may look to them that the student is pretty intact. Um, uh, but um, again, we try to get a release to speak to the outside providers so that we can brief them on what's actually happening. Um, let's see. Um, on the next slide, um, there are some issues that uh, affect uh, students' views on things. Um, some people, some students don't want to leave the area if they take a medical leave. There is no requirement that they go home. They can live anywhere that they want to. We have no control over that. If they want to stay local to the campus, that's certainly their prerogative. Um, some people feel that they don't have the funds necessary for treatment, but uh, here in D.C. we're lucky, but most communities also have um, low-cost or no-cost treatment options. Um, some people don't want to leave because they say they, they are not going to graduate with their class and somehow that becomes an issue. But uh, we would <clears throat> typically point out to them that um, in a couple of years it's going to really make no difference what year you graduated. The more important thing is that you graduate and that when you're in school you're not just barely hanging on by your fingernails but that you're actually thriving. And, wouldn't time off enable you to get the treatment you need and to thrive. Um, some people fear losing their friends. As I mentioned, nothing to stop them from seeing friends on campus. Some fear losing a scholarship. Um, uh, I'm not an expert on scholarships, but I do know that some of the uh, scholarships can be held for them upon their return. Uh, sometimes there may be loan forbearance uh, uh, given that it's a medical circumstance that causes, caused them to take the leave. Um, last bullet here says some fear that they will just mark time at home, and um, that's where we discuss with them the need to do something productive. Um, on this last slide, um, I have some useful references. Uh, the first item here is actually in the webinar um, uh, attachment uh, that you might have seen when you got the notice of this meeting. If you click on resources, if you go back to that item, uh, you'll see it says resources, click on that, and you will actually get the entire text of this article. And this article covers in more detail the, the issues that I'm talking about here today. Um, my colleagues and I at Dartmouth back in uh, the 1990s uh, published those last two uh, references there where we actually went back and we pulled the, uh, the GPAs uh, of every student who had taken a leave for the previous three years and compared that to, um, we com looked at the overall uh, cumulative GPA before the leave, the, the cumulative GPA after the leave, only including those courses taken after the leave, and then we looked at the term, the last term before uh, the leave and the first term back, and there were dramatic and significant um, improvements in academic functioning. Uh, so the first article there that's dated 1992 was our initial take on the data, and the um, 
1995, we had three more years worth of data to report on those same uh, set of students. So those are um, uh, articles you might want to take a look at. I think the most important one is the top one, and that is available to you online. Uh, with, I will turn over. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Phil and Tom, for uh, giving us this overview. Uh, just before I introduce Karen, I want to make one quick comment, which is that uh, I think we're, we're going to make a command decision uh, on the fly, and there are a number of questions that have come in that are really sort of specific and practical. Rather than take time now, I, I think we're going to maybe after uh, Karen and I speak uh, for, the, for the next segments, we're going to go directly to a Q&A from the audience because uh, we'd really like to get to as many of the audience questions. Again, many of them are, are kind of practical and clinical, so we'd really like to, uh, to get to them if we can. Uh, we're now going to turn things over uh, to Karen Bauer to hear a, a little bit more about some of the concerns and challenges and issues around uh, mental health leaves from the student uh, advocate perspective. Thanks. Thanks, Victor. Uh, this is Karen Bauer, and as Victor said, I've been representing students um, in leaves of absence and issues involving universities for the last 15 years. Um, and the, I wanted to share the view of, of students and their concerns with um, leaves of absence and issues that they address in determining whether or not to take voluntary leaves of absence and uh, concerns that they have about the return process. Um, first, as a and background issues and public policy issues, I just want people to bear in mind that um, you know leaves of absence can benefit students and universities in terms of students being able to be at their healthiest and to be able to successfully complete their academic program and graduate. As a public policy issue, we want to encourage students to take leaves of absence when necessary and to remove barriers that exist to leaves of absence so that students can take them when medically necessary. Um, in addition, to bear in mind that um, the anti-discrimination statutes and want to make sure that students with disabilities are not treated differently than students without disabilities, and also that students with mental disabilities are treated similarly to students with physical disabilities. Um, and so just with those in mind, I wanted to address some of the concerns that students have. And these, again, are concerns that I hear most often from students who have been uh, upset with the leave process and have concerns about it. Um, the, most, uh, the most common one is that they do feel that they've been forced to take a leave of absence or that they're being punished or made to feel inadequate um, in their ability to complete the academic program. Uh, and so they, uh, you know, they, they have these concerns. Um, there's, um, they're also concerned that there's a, a, an academic gap that they're going to have to explain if they take a leave of absence, and as uh, Phil mentioned, concern about graduating with their class. Uh, that concern is not just um, in the one about being uh, in lockstep with the rest of their class and graduating with their class year, but concerns about the social implications and how they're going to be able to maintain their friendships, that if other people are a year ahead of them, they'll be taking different classes. If they're going into their junior or senior year, their friends might graduate and they might not know anyone uh, when they're returning to school. The, um, the other concerns, and many Phil mentioned, so I won't go into detail, are social isolation, loss of the support network, maintaining friendships if they have to take a leave and leave the area. Um, many have expressed difficulty, uh, concerns with difficulty of meeting leave requirements and uncertainty about what they have to do in order to meet those requirements and successfully return. Um, and of course, they do have a lot of financial concerns about what the impact of leave of absence will be. Um, so in addressing many of these concerns, um, first is a, 
a, a policy, a, a leave of absence policy needs to be transparent. It should be in writing and easily accessible to students. Many, many times I try to find a leave of absence policy and it is buried somewhere in a student handbook and um, students are not uh, aware of it, they're not sure where it is and have difficulty finding it. The policies are also not clear. Um, policies need to provide adequate notice to the students about what's going to happen and what the process is, including what's going to happen to their classes, their transcript, their housing, their loans, financial aid, and their return conditions. Um, and also the policies have to be followed. Many times I do see um, policies that look good on paper, but uh, it are not followed by the university. Um, so it, if these policies are not clear and transparent to students and they know what's going to happen, they'll be reluctant to take a leave of absence. Um, the policies must also be voluntary. Again, this is where I hear students talk about feeling that they've been coerced. Um, a, a lot of times what, what, uh, what students report to me is that the conversation goes along the lines of the school thinks that they need to take a leave of absence and that if they don't take a leave of absence, they'll be placed on an involuntary leave of absence and that that will be much more difficult for them, that it will be reflected in their transcript and that uh, it will be more difficult for them to return with additional conditions. Um, and that's not a voluntary, that is a coerced leave and not voluntary. So I think it's problematic to use involuntary leave of absence as leverage. More appropriately, I think discussions about what the circumstances are and what the impact on their academic record will be if they don't take advantage of a leave of absence um, as something to benefit them. Uh, students often also report to me statements that are made during the discussions um, that imply that, you know, maybe this isn't the best school for you, uh, not every student is college material, this school is really rigorous and you may be better off somewhere else. And uh, statements like that do make students feel that they're not welcome there, that the school believes they're a problem and wishes they would just go away and go someplace else. So as Phil said, it's really important that the process be voluntary and that student control the process. Um, and in that vein, the, the policy should also be flexible. Um, as Phil said, it, they may not need to take a, a be, or be willing to take a leave of absence initially. This is an ongoing discussion with um, presentation to students about what types of options there are for them, including extending deadlines, extending classes, dropping classes. Um, and also taking a leave of absence is one of the uh, remedies that they may use in order to be able to uh, get the help that they need and succeed. Uh, I think uh, the policy sounds like at Phil School is a little more, um, perhaps fewer students there use leaves of absence. The bulk of students I talk to are really individuals who are experiencing mental illness for the first time and uh, it may be undiagnosed and untreated initially and they're really not aware of the impact of the, the depression and anxiety on them. And, uh, uh, and uh, a lot of the students that I talk with have depression and anxiety and are really having difficulty functioning and some may have suicidal ideation as well. Um, so it's got to be a flexible policy to be able to address all of those situations. Uh, it is beneficial to have no deadline for leaves of absence. Those places that have a very early deadline, like uh, six weeks, uh, I'm sorry, like four weeks into the program, make it challenging for students who need a leave later on to take it. Um, and if appropriate, it, it may be, uh, it, it may be helpful to encourage students to get their parents involved uh, in the process and discuss the options with them. Um, the policies also have to be individualized, um, no blanket policies that require leave of absence for a mandatory duration. Oftentimes, sometimes I've seen policies that are, they have to take two semesters and that may be a, a longer period of time than some students need in order to uh, regain stability and be able to effectively participate successfully in the program. So a student shouldn't be required to take more time away than needed. 
uh, as for the conditions on the return, conditions also have to be individualized, reasonable, and relevant to the reason for this, that the student took the leave of absence. Um, the most common condition is usually medical treatment and documentation, um, which is a reasonable requirement. But uh, in, there are some requests where uh, the request for medical documentation is overly broad or too invasive. Uh, what's needed is some uh, affirmation that the student is doing well, is stable, and is ready to return, and, and not an entire background history of their uh, mental illness and their treatment. Um, so no unlimited or ongoing access. Um, would be appropriate for return from a leave of absence. And uh, good uh, weight is supposed to be given to the treatment provider's opinion, both regarding the treatment plan and their readiness to return, that a student who has had ongoing treatment with a treatment provider, usually that treatment provider um, knows the student much better than uh, an individual who might be doing just an assessment uh, of the student uh, at the point of taking a leave or at their return. One thing students mention as, as critical to them is that confidentiality isn't assured during this process. They want to make sure that their mental health records are not going to be broadly shared and that they will be protected, their information will be kept confidential. So that's an important element of the policy and process. Um, there are check-in conversations usually, as Phil mentioned. Um, those can sometimes be onerous for students. If a student has taken a leave and lives far off campus, to come back for a check-in conversation um, can be quite costly and time-consuming. And to the extent possible, technology should be used to assist them in that process, perhaps Skype or some other technology to allow them to have the check-in process but not have to travel cross-country. And then finally, I think recognizing that there are a lot of challenges to finding new treatment providers when taking leaves of absence. If a student is moving back home and they haven't had a <clears throat> mental health treatment in the past, it can take quite a while to set up a new treatment team. Oftentimes there are months-long delays in getting psychiatric care. And that that delay doesn't reflect a lack of commitment to treatment on the student's part and should not be held against them. Um, the additional requirements that I see usually involve around in requiring students to engage in employment or take classes. And again, if there are requirements, they should be individualized, tailored to the student's needs, and benefit the students. I think recommending that students engage in some of those activities can be helpful to provide structure to the students, but requiring them <clears throat> is often problematic um, because it, students um, find those requirements to be needlessly stressful and have their own challenges. For example, taking classes somewhere else may seem like a small requirement, but it is costly uh, and, and, and it is a difficult process for a student sometimes to get registered at a school, attend classes at a school where they don't know anyone, establish new friendships, establish new treatment providers in the area, and, and then dismantle all of that and return back to their primary school and set all that up again. Um, so it's challenging for the students. And the classes themselves, while they may provide credits that are transferable, don't reduce the number of semesters that a student has to stay at their primary university. So there are oftentimes um, challenges that come with these uh, conditions. Uh, employment as well may be challenging for a student given uh, the climate and uh, the, the economic conditions in their area. And it may be challenging for a student to get employment when they're used to being a student and living a student lifestyle and it's something that they're comfortable with and feel good at, whereas employment is a new challenge and can be needlessly stressful for them. And it may be difficult to find employment that offers the flexibility that they need in order to seek mental health treatment, which is primarily what they want to be doing during a mental health leave of absence. Um, the return process should be timely. That means that once they submit their materials for return, it should be promptly reviewed and responded to. 
uh, it should be a reasonable time frame for when they need to seek re-enrollment. If it's too early, it really is tantamount to a, a, a mandatory leave. So if they're submitting it too early in the process, that means that any student who needs a leave of absence after that date um, can't submit their materials for reinstatement um, and so may wind up taking a year off or a year and a half off um, if it's too early. And in addition, the, the time frame for when they're given a decision for when a student can return needs to give them adequate time to prepare for the transition. Um, I've seen students get notice maybe two weeks in advance of class that they can find that, that they can come back. And it becomes really challenging to give notice to an employer, to give notice to a landlord and not incur additional charges, to find transportation that might now be very expensive to get back to school, to get housing, to set up treatment providers. And so having a little bit more time so that there's a smooth transition process does assist students in making the transition work for them. Um, Students are very concerned about maintaining their relationships with friends when they leave campus. Um, and I think it's important to view this as a team effort and that the student that is on leave of absence is still your student and hopefully will be coming back to the university and succeeding. So allowing students to maintain connections with the university and if they're in the area to attend extracurricular activities and campus events, to maintain contact with, with teachers or administrative staff if there are questions, to visit friends on campus, to allow them access to some of the resources like email, ID cards, or library, and even to allow them to have uh, access to continued health insurance if that's something that they need um, and, and won't have access to elsewhere. Um, some other suggestions, um, a lot of schools are taking up orientation materials to talk to students about depression and anxiety and mental health issues at the school, but one part that's left out of that is informing them about disability and accommodations. Um, Students often say that they didn't know. They knew that they were feeling depressed and they knew that they were anxious, but they didn't know that those were disabilities and that they might be able to get accommodations for them. And so I think that piece is important to, to make sure that they're aware um, of the mental health piece and the impl implications for it and what the school can do to assist them if they're having mental health challenges. Another thing that might be helpful would be to have something like a mentor, coach, or a liaison for a student who's on leave. That would be somebody who stays in contact with the student um, to check in on how they're doing and assist them with any questions they have as they transition back. A point of contact for them so that they, they can make the transition as smooth as possible. Um, it's particularly important for those students who might be coming back off cycle or off semester. Oftentimes I hear from them that they've sort of fallen through the cracks and that because they're on a different time frame, uh, they may miss things, uh, not be given proper notice of deadlines or have different deadlines and um, may not get the same type of advising. And so for those students, it's particularly important to have uh, that point of contact to make sure they don't fall through the cracks. Um, Another thing to help students transition easily is to allow them to register for classes and housing when they're anticipating returning from leave, even if it's provisional. What often happens, unfortunately, is they get noticed that they can come back uh, and then other students have already registered for classes and they have a lot of stress about whether or not they're going to be able to get classes that they need um, and get housing. So handling that uh, in an earlier time frame would relieve the stress and, and may assist students in taking leave and returning from leave. Some other ideas for things to assist students would be peer support for returning students and those considering to return, having uh, faculty, staff, and students talk about their experiences with depression, mental health, and leaves of absence in order to normalize it. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems is that leaves of absence are thought of as not really normal when in actuality quite a, lot of number, quite a large number of students do take leaves of absence every year. And so if we normalize the process a little more, students may, who need leaves of absence may be more inclined to take them at an earlier time. Um, and, and also uh, webinars about the leave process might be helpful to educate students. 
Um, some additional suggestions include um, really the nomenclature. What is your policy called? Is it a leave of absence or is it a withdrawal? Um, students may find leaves of absence more palatable than withdrawal. Withdrawal seems to imply that you're separated from the university completely and often have a readmission process as opposed to a return from leave of absence. And for many students that can be off-putting in terms of requesting a leave. Um, uh, I think some other issues just floating out there are generous tuition um, and housing reimbursement policies would assist students in addressing their concerns about the financial impact um, and giving students adequate time to move out, say goodbye, arrange transportation and pack, because oftentimes students take leave and are given 24 hours or 48 hours to remove themselves from campus. And that, that can be really challenging for them, um, especially if they're moving out of town. Um, so uh, hopefully a lot of these will be helpful in providing leave policies that, that work for students. Um, so back to you, Victor. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Karen. So uh, just again, uh, a quick update that uh, we will be going after my just couple of comments uh, directly to our questions and answers because we have had uh, a bunch of questions come in. We want to try to get uh, to as many of those as we possibly can uh, while we're on the uh, webinar. But we will do, uh, I, th I believe we will be able to uh, get through uh, the questions and uh, send you all responses down the line if we don't get to everyone. So uh, if, if I can just try to maybe summarize what, uh, what Tom and Phil and Karen have uh, presented and, and just leave you with some broad principles. Uh, I think that thinking about this process, the goal of the Office of Civil Rights, and I think the goal of, of what we're all trying to do as uh, clinicians and administrators in higher ed, is to be as flexible and individualized as we can. Uh, and I'm going to just say a few words about each of these ideas uh, over the next couple of slides. Uh, it, it seems to me, and I, I think this came clear uh, both from the comments from, you know, from Tom and Phil, who are really representing the school uh, counseling and administration side, and from Karen representing the student side, that for this process to work ideally well, uh, that really the goal here is to provide support and care and the flexibility necessary for the student uh, to, to increase the likelihood that students can take the time off to get care when they need it and still function in a successful and fully engaged and, and non-stigmatized way with their college or university. Uh, I, I know there was one question about, we, we focused, it seems like, on undergraduates, but I think pretty much everything we have said uh, would apply to grad students as well. Um, so these uh, policies and, and um, concepts really are, shouldn't be functional across the board in universities. One of the ways I found very helpful to think about this is really trying to think about can you find analogous circumstances uh, with a medical condition, um, a student who might have a chronic and persistent medical condition or students who may have an acute medical condition, how would you handle that and, and would it be analogous to the way you would handle uh, leaves uh, for mental health purposes. Uh, the other thing, the other point I want to make is that, uh, you know, Karen tends to get involved and, and often uh, the situations become contentious because we don't often or always communicate as clearly and understand the perspectives of the parties involved in these situations, which include students and their families very often and clinicians and administrators and, and maybe even other, uh, other students in the system who may all have uh, parts to play in how some of these situations play out. Uh, and it's also important that while I'm presenting these as separate ideas, they really are all kind of overlapping. So just to flesh out a little bit, this idea of flexibility, 
and, and I think you've heard this again in both presentations, that uh, the fewer restrictions and specific, you know, very limiting guidelines you have, uh, the better your policy is, that the policy should be really addressing the specific circumstances and needs and, and concerns of the particular students. And, and, you know, just as with physical illnesses, there are acute dramatic things, there are chronic persistent things, they have different kinds of needs and, and uh, in some ways trajectories and, and the ways that you would address them with a student would vary. The same should hold true of mental health leaves. They're, they don't all fit into one bucket. So things like saying you need to take a year off or you need to take uh, a semester off might be appropriate in many circumstances, but actually really inappropriate in others. Uh, and the condition should be driven again by the specific uh, times and circumstances of the student. Uh, many of the problems that come up really, uh, I think as Karen uh, intimated, come, flow out of a sense that the student might not either understand, and often the family too, might not understand what the uh, reasons for particular conditions or circumstances are. Uh, and, and, you know, very often if that stuff is really laid out clearly, uh, what the what the needs are, why this is being done in the student's best interest, very often uh, the process will go better and the student's needs, uh, again, should take precedence over the needs of the university while, you know, we need to be realistic. I mean, we're a student who has a persistent problem, who needs to take repeated leaves uh, for leg perfectly legitimate reasons because of a chronic recurring condition, it, something like tuition refund insurance uh, might be uh, something that might be a reasonable and fair requirement. Again, as long as you handle a medical problem uh, the same way or along the same lines that you would handle a, a mental health problem. Uh, and, and I think, as I've already said, if students feel their concerns are primary and the institution is really trying to care for them, uh, I think many of the problems that emerge may very well uh, become, you know, sort of less, less problematic, less persistent. Uh, I've suggested already that, you know, can you, in thinking through whether a particular way of handling the transcript or tuition refunds or whether or not the student can remain on campus, can you uh, think of a, a situation where there might be a medical condition, uh, you know, for students who might represent uh, some kind of disruptive influence because of their behavior? Well, sometimes the analogy could be to a student with a contagious disorder. What, under what circumstances would you or wouldn't you allow them to uh, stay on campus or, or to, uh, you know, be involved in other kinds of school activities? Uh, I know a number of questions have come in about the, the processes and assurances, uh, and I think it'll be interesting to uh, talk about those. But, you know, the value of getting both a uh, note from the clinician back home that does give some indication of, uh, of both the course of treatment and the student's readiness and having that reviewed by the counseling service is a way of making sure that you know, both the uh, clinician back home is, to be quite frank, legitimate because there are some rare circumstances where people might not be completely uh, forthcoming or honest in the process. And hopefully having that second level of review would help to flesh that out. And also uh, many clinicians who, who are locally based might not understand some of the challenges of living on campus in a less structured environment. It's also, by the way, an opportunity to set up an ongoing treatment plan. And one thing that uh, I think hasn't been talked about is whether it is okay 
to uh, ask students to have some kind of ongoing treatment when they come back to campus after a leave. And I think the answer to this is as long as it is the way you would handle somebody with a medical condition and as long as it's reasonable and handled in a reasonable and fair and non-coercive way, as long as it's conveyed that it's in the uh, best interest and need of the student, uh, then it's not inappropriate to have some fair and reasonable level of expectation of follow-up care. Uh, and finally, as I said before, when conflicts come up, one of the important ways of managing this is really trying to understand the different perspectives. It's very common that students and parents are, as Karen said, worried about loss of income uh, through tuition and uh, you know, loss of credits and things like this. There's also often concern that the school might cr create barriers to letting the student return. Uh, even though the conditions have been laid out, sometimes an article in the school newspaper you know, will uh, tell a story of some student who may or may not have had a difficult time getting back into school. One uh, story like that can create a tremendous amount of uneasiness and distrust uh, and uh, can really create barriers. So it's really important for the people in the uh, upper administration, for the deans, for a counseling service, to make sure, as Karen said, that the information is transparent, but that there is communication with, with students, with student leaders, uh, and through student media that the, the process really does 98% of the time uh, work as uh, it is supposed to be working. So with, with these uh, comments in mind, I am now going to invite the other speakers to join me and uh, we can begin to uh, try to take a look at some of the questions that have come through. And again, we will try to uh, address questions in an email that uh, will be sent to the participants with uh, comments from us as uh, if we don't get to everything, which I'm sure we won't. So if uh, Karen and, uh, and Tom and Phil, if you can join me, I I'm just going to begin uh, presenting some of the questions. Some actually may be fairly quick to get to, uh, but we have about 20 minutes and probably about 25 or 30 questions, so let's see where, where we can go. Uh, uh, a question came up of, for a student with a documented disability already established with the disabilities office, would there be any changes to the uh, leave of absence process at, at, you know, at most institutions and, and why or why not? Um, this is Phil. I, I think it would uh, probably be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. It's hard to answer that question in the abstract. Right, and I would say just as a, as a response to that, that, you know, with the student's agreement, they're often, you know, when you think about this, the goal of really setting up these conditions both for leave and for return is to set up a course of, uh, a, a course of treatment and, and a course going forward that is most likely to thoughtfully address the needs of the student. So if somebody is known to the disabilities office, it's certainly with the student's agreement may be valuable to get their input uh, because that might help to clarify really choices around uh, some of the conditions both for leave and, and return that might make sense for this particular student given their, their history and their you know, treatment needs and problems. Karen, you have any yep. thoughts about that? Well, I agree. It's, it's, it's difficult to answer in the abstract. I mean, there are some policies and some situations where a student is already in treatment and with their treatment provider they decide that they need a leave of absence. They, are, they take the leave of absence. They don't really need a lot of conditions on their return. They know when they're better they'll seek to return. And uh, so it, 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 really, it really varies on whether disability, you know, how and it, whether disability services will be involved. Right, but the fundamental process at the school would be the same, whether the student is known or not known to the disabilities office. And uh, a question came in, and I think this is worth clarifying because I think this is one of these where there uh, might be no direct answer and that might be reassuring. When, when the dean is involved, and Tom, maybe this uh, sits in, in your lap most clearly, uh, is it the dean of students or an academic dean? Uh, 
uh, can you say a couple of words uh, of how that, you know, what, how, how both Georgetown does this and uh, whether you're aware of what other schools do on that front? Sure. That's a great question, and um, let me see if I can provide some clarity to, to that question. Um, Georgetown um, is structured, I think, in a unique way in terms of its academic advisement of students. And so, as you probably know, at Georgetown University, we have four different undergraduate uh, schools. And um, I uh, work currently for Georgetown College, which is the largest of the four undergraduate schools, the College of Arts and Science. And we have academic deans, um, assistant and associate deans that have a cohort of students. So we are not technically part of the Student Affairs Division. We are a part of the Academic Affairs Division at Georgetown, and the conversations um, that happen between us and our students are really dean to advisee type um, conversations and that type of relationship. So it is not going up necessarily through the Division of Student Affairs uh, or the Dean of Students in that direction. Um, other institutions may run differently or have a different setup or a different system, um, but the system here really does work in the sense that even though Georgetown is a fairly large uh, undergraduate um, institution, we are still, I think, consider ourselves to be personal um, and personalized with um, the care that we give to our students. And so I keep going back to that word, a collaborative effort, and I really do believe at Georgetown that's what makes this process work for our students and that there's a team of people trying to support and work with that individual student. And going back to your your uh, uh, previous question, um, if the student is registered with um, our accommodations office, the Academic Resource Center, we would certainly include that individual um, in the conversations um, to, to help guide that student. So um, hopefully that provides some clarity in terms of our structure and how we work um, with our students within Georgetown College. And I'll just add my two cents to this, that, uh, you know, there's no right way to do it as long as it's transparent, as long as it's not too onerous for the students to find their way through the system. Uh, and really what's, it, what's important is to uh, make sure that the parties involved, whether it's a, a dean of students who's sitting in student services who, who, you know, is working with the academic side or an academic dean who is working with counseling or people on the student services side. There needs to be communication. Obviously, the communication needs to be thoughtful about not sharing more information than is necessary, but there, there have to be conduits of communication with the bursars and registrar's office, with your housing office for students who are in residence halls. So, you know, having a committee that works on this who have a really kind of clear and transparent process can make it much easier both for the students and for the institution to keep track of all this because in, in some places I've seen that, you know, each time there's a leave of absence, it's as if it's never happened before. Uh, the process gets very ungainly and you have a student who's already in distress who's being sent from office to office to fill out forms or, you know, plead their case or something and that's certainly not something you want to do. Uh, the next question we have uh, are, recommendation, are recommendations from outside providers accepted? So I think this maybe means in relation to uh, recommending a leave. Uh, maybe, Phil, you want to say a couple of words of how you might relate or how you might handle things with a student who has an outside clinician while they're attending school and that student needs to take a leave? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, in a case uh, where students uh, has an ongoing, long-standing relationship with an outside provider, um, the, the leave recommendation still has to come from our office, but what we will do is work closely with the outside provider in understanding the situation, uh, coming up with recommendations, and then uh, discussing that with the student. So we will work with the outside provider in a case like that. Great. Uh, so, so I'm going to actually combine one, two questions. Uh, one if I could, is, if I could intercept. Yeah, no, go ahead, Karen. Exactly. I'm sorry. Um, I think a lot of schools may handle that differently. Where if an outside provider does recommend a leave of absence, then it might go to the dean's, um, the dean of students or uh, appropriate dean. 
to, to request that, and it would be the outside provider that would be providing the treatment plan and treatment recommendations as the individual who knows the student best and understands what they may need in terms of their leave and their return. But they might also weave in some one of the senior people from counseling just to make sure that everybody feels that, that the plan makes sense across the board, no? They may, they may involve them and notify them, yeah, um, right. but I, I don't think the, the, the CAPS office would be the one that would be making treatment recommendations. Yeah, right. So, so I'm going to combine, as I said, two questions. One is, are you aware of uh, any kind of deadline for, uh, have, for when a student could take a leave? And the example that's given is the last day of the semester. And I'm going to add to that a, a, another question about, are, are there any conceivable circumstances under which a retroactive leave might be appropriate? This is for everybody. <laughs> Uh, I would say yes, retroactive. There are situations where a retroactive leave would be appropriate, and many universities do use them. Um, I think the latest possible date for when a student can request a leave of absence is the most beneficial to students. Um, I've mostly seen retroactive leaves of absence in situations where students do have undiagnosed or untreated or undertreated mental illness and uh, did not ask for a leave of absence at the time because they really weren't able to. They really didn't understand their illness and how it was impacting them and that they were really, you know, how unable to function they were. And so in those circumstances when there is some contemporaneous documentation and recognition that a student is really not performing academically, not attending classes, perhaps not leaving their room, then in those circumstances retroactive leave is granted. Uh, Phil and Tom, do you want to make a couple of comments about that? Or they were a severe mental illness, and there's contemporaneous uh, records of such. Um, we could take a look at that, um, and that's a possibility. So, for example, if a student was in a hospital uh, or so impaired that they went home but never requested a leave, um, and we can get you know confirmation of all of this, we could take a look at that. Um, it would need to be in the relatively relative near term. In other words, it can't be from uh, three semesters ago. Um, it's it, we've had requests as far back as uh, five years. Can you can you do a retroactive leave from five years ago? Um, so you know, again, it depends on the circumstances. It depends on the documentation. We've had some requests where there was virtually no document, no contemporaneous documentation, and on those we simply said no. The only thing I would add is that again, I think, um, and I know, you know, institutions across the country vary in size and depending on, um, you know, the outreach um, from different offices to students. I mean, we're very fortunate here at Georgetown to know, we know typically in advance when a student is starting to struggle. Our faculty have a good reporting mechanism to let the deans know, and we can get a sense very early on or even as the semester progresses, and we're very fortunate then to, to reach out to that student and or his or her parents, um, provided the students uh, allow us to speak to his or her parents, and try to um, prevent that from happening where there is a complete wipe out of some sort academically, and then we're looking at it after the fact as a retroactive um, medical leave of absence. So we're very lucky here to have a good system in place to try to catch those students if we can um, before that happens. So it's not that common that we get those requests um, all the time. Would you agree? Right, but yeah, I, I think it is very rare, but to, to follow my own principle, I can think of both a circumstance where a student might have a significant psychotic illness and, uh, you know, still be walking around campus uh, appearing to function, but clearly significantly enough impaired that they might not have the wherewithal to ask for leave. Uh, and I can also think of medical circumstances where a student might have a, an accident, you know, during finals or before finals, uh, be unable to complete the semester and also, you know, not, not be able to request the leave until the semester's done. So, uh, you know, there certainly seem to be those rare circumstances. As you say, if the system is working well and, and, and you've got a, a good, 
a good system that's watching out for your students. If somebody disappears, hopefully somebody knows it. Um, but uh, th there certainly are circumstances where that retroactive leave might might be something that might need to happen and might be the reasonable thing. Ken, uh, we've had a couple of questions about tuition insurance. I jump in here. Um, um, sorry? Yeah. If I can just piggyback on uh, Dean Cherlanzio's um, comments. Um, uh, we, I think part of it depends on having a good surveillance system. So, for example, the deans, our deans stay in pretty close contact with their advisees. Uh, we also have a Students of Concern Committee, as many if not most universities now do as well. So we're constantly sur surveying the, um, the student situation, both from an academic standpoint and from a behavioral standpoint. So if you had a psychotic student who uh, was out there and not functioning well, the odds are somebody would have picked it up whether it's the dean or residence life or some other office. Um, so it's, it's not that, uh, at least on our campus, we're lucky it's very tight knit. There's a lot of eyes and ears on the ground. Um, so we're fortunate to be able to catch those people. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Right, this certainly these kinds of circumstances should certainly uh, be the rarity, uh, but, but they certainly might come up once every couple of years or so. Uh, can we say a couple of words of, of how you all handle tuition reimbursements and Karen, maybe some of the things you've heard about that? What are, what are some of the uh, benefits of that? Do you recommend it for, for all students? Uh, do you make it a requirement for students who might have already uh, gone on a leave and have come back and might have a chronic condition? So, um, certainly, uh, I do think tuition reimbursement is one very big piece of what makes taking a leave of absence possible for students. And uh, um, the fear of um, losing that tuition money and not being able to then complete their education is one thing that, pro that uh, stops them from taking a leave when it might be necessary. So to the extent tuition reimbursement is offered, I think that goes a long way towards uh, in helping students to make that decision and make leave effective for them. Um, as well as uh, maintaining scholarships, extending the deadlines for students to get those scholarships, and making the, the money available in subsequent semesters, um, all are, are helpful. Um, there is, as you mentioned, tuition insurance. Um, it's often not that, that publicized. Um, students are, are often not aware or their families are not aware that that exists even though it may be in some of the materials. It's usually not highlighted and so they're not aware of it or may think that it's not applicable to their situation, especially if it's a student who has never had uh, a mental health challenge before. Um, so I think highlighting that, making, letting that be available, although there are some concerns with tuition, re uh, tuition insurance because it, it treats oftentimes mental health and medical conditions differently and may offer uh, reduced benefits to students with mental illness. Um, so certainly even if that's offered, a school can um, make parity um, so that the students are all treated equally. So Karen, I, I agree with you and I think, um, you know, we do need to do a better job in terms of making sure our students are aware of um, the student insurance policies um, and whatnot. And that's something that I think probably most institutions need to work on in terms of that communication. So totally agree with you. Um, you know, for example, um, if we've had a student that, that's uh, taken a medical leave and, you know, obviously it's, it's prolonging their time um, in terms of earning their degree and it's starting to impact whether it's federal financial aid, um, we will coordinate with our Office of Student Financial Services where they will ask for a progress report on the student because they have to report then why there's a change in the student's um, graduation date. But it's there so that way the students can continue to secure the finances that they need um, to continue their education. Um, the other thing that you mentioned in terms of, um, you know, the loss of tuition, that does become complicated and I, and I agree with you. There is a sliding scale here at Georgetown as the semester progresses and if it's towards the end of a term, 
um, and a student does take the leave, um, their refund is very, very little, if any. So that is a big deal, and I, and I certainly understand that, and, and that is something that, you know, I think at Georgetown and probably most institutions, ha they have to wrestle with what that policy should be. So, so just a word on this, I think it is really valuable for universities to make students aware of tuition insurance. Uh, I, I know a number of schools, and at a school uh, I was a dean of students, we had the policy of a student was uh, refunded tuition the first time they went on a leave, but if there was any suggestion that the, their problem might be a, a chronic problem, we would ask them to buy tuition insurance. As Karen mentioned, uh, s some of the policies don't handle mental health problems the same way they do medical problems, but the, it's important to know that even with those companies, the school has some latitude to negotiate parity, that the school can actually insist with those companies that the mental health uh, conditions be handled the same way. That might raise the premium slightly, but these insurance policies are fairly inexpensive and certainly way less expensive than a semester of tuition. So uh, I think unfortunately we have to finish uh, in just a minute or two. Uh, if Phil, Tom, and Karen, you wanna make some just final like 30 second comments and we will, as I said before, uh, try to uh, gather the questions that were submitted and send them around among the speakers. Uh, and send some uh, comments back to you as, as much as we're able. Um, if I can jump in here, I'll try to make four points in 30 seconds. So wish <laughs> Good. Um, first of all, uh, our law school, which is a separate campus also in Washington, D.C., actually has a unique solution to the uh, tuition issue, which is that they will not refund the money, but they will credit it towards the next semester. So it's not like the money is lost. That's interesting, great. Mm -hmm. The thing I wanna say is that um, our medical leave policy is one medical leave policy for medical medical problems and mental health medical problems. Uh, it's on our website, it's caps, C-A-P-S, dot Georgetown dot E-D-U, that's our homepage. And on the left-hand side, there's a link for medical leave of absence, and it has our policy and all associated links. So. Uh, and that, was, that policy was approved by OCR, so you might want to take a look at it. Again, caps.georgetown.edu, look for medical leave on the left-hand side. Um, another thing OCR wanted us to include are an, is an appeal process. So in our case, if a, if a student uh, does not like the outcome of our review, they can go to the um, Assistant Vice President for Student Health who uh, sometimes affirms what we decide and sometimes has overruled us. But uh, it's important to have an appeal process. Um, uh, and I think that covers my points. And the, the only thing that I'll add, this is Tom, um, is that I really agree with everything that was shared in terms of Karen's um, perspective and your perspective on transparency. Um, and really, I think that centers on the approach um, that the, the dean or whomever is speaking with the student, um, you know, you, you, you have to be able to engage the student and have them understand really what the medical leave is intended to do. And I know that students, as Karen mentioned, sometimes feel that they're kind of coerced into, into taking a medical leave. But really, our approach here is that this is a temporary time out. It is not an ending, not an ending of your matriculation at Georgetown. It's not a termination of your time at Georgetown. And that, it's, that, the, that the door is open. It's just that you are taking some time away to focus on whatever the mental health issue may be and that was impacting your ability to succeed, to succeed as a student. So I think the approach and how one has those conversations with, stu with students is really important and that the transparency piece does definitely need to be there. Thanks, Tom. Karen, 30 seconds. Um, 
I think one of the biggest challenges for students is when they aren't able to return and that a decision, I think to just bear in mind that a decision to deny a return from leave of absence really comes very close to imposing an involuntary leave of absence, which we haven't discussed at length, but it, it does require that, uh, you know, students can't be required to be cured, that if they um, can demonstrate themselves and with their treatment provider that they're ready to return, that um, they, they can return and continue their studies. Thanks, and uh, thanks to our panelists, and thanks to all of our participants for joining us today. Uh, we hope you found this presentation to be informative, and we will try to get uh, to everyone with uh, answers to your questions. The presentation uh, is being has been recorded, so will be available along with the uh, PowerPoints. On, on SPRC's website, I think you'll be receiving information about how you can access all of this. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for your participation on today's conference call. At this time, all parties may disconnect.